now. So uh, the Poisson-Boltzmann equation for the concentration of ions at point R is, uh, or for the for the electrostatic potential phi of R is given by Laplacian or minus Laplacian phi equals rho f of R, or let's write it like this, minus epsilon Laplacian of phi plus sum over k of ck zero qk e to the minus beta epsilon, uh, beta qk phi of R. So this is the density or the concentration of fixed charges. So it's walls or containers or whatever you want. And uh, this is the contribution of mobile ions in the solution. So as we saw, as I said yesterday, this equation uh, is a very complex nonlinear partial differential equation that you have to solve in certain geometry, which is uh, given by all the fixed external charges that you may have in your system, and uh, by the different species of ions that you have, which have uh, their charges and initial concentration. And uh, we have the in addition, there is the boundary condition that you have to, to take into account, and the boundary condition being that the, the two types of boundary condition, either fixed potential or fixed charges. Then we saw that if beta E phi is much smaller than one, then you can do a linear approximation to the nonlinear part by expanding to first order the exponential, and then you get what's called the debye huckel equation. And the debye huckel equation, so if I, I can write it as minus epsilon Laplacian square plus kappa d, sorry, um, so I'll write it like this. Minus Laplacian square plus kappa d square phi <coughs> equals rho f of r by epsilon. This is the debye hucker equation. So it's a linear equation. Now it's linearized. So this is true when this quantity is small enough. And uh, what I want to show you now is that this equation, so the difference of this equation, the effect, the whole effect of the mobile ion is this, is this uh, kappa d square, which we'll see in field theory, it's like a mass term. So if this term is not present, it's the standard Coulomb, it's the standard Poisson equation, which tells you that phi would be as one over r, but because of this constant term here, we'll see that this implies exponential decay of the potential phi at large distances. Okay, by the way, uh, there was a question yesterday when I told you, so I don't remember who asked it, about the initial guess. So I told you that in order to solve this, you start with a certain phi zero. You, at phi zero fixed, you solve for the Poisson equation here you get a phi one and then you iterate. And the question was, uh, how do you choose the initial phi zero? So the initial phi zero, one common choice is to solve the debye huckel equation, which you can solve easily because it's a linear equation. So there are many ways to solve it. So you solve it initially, you get a certain solution, which you call phi zero, which you inject now in the nonlinear equation. And you can start iterating from this uh, linear approximation to refine it to obtain the exact solution numerically for the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. Uh, was there any other question yesterday? Okay. Okay, so uh, an exercise that we will do is to see what happens 
and this is where I stopped, I think, yesterday. When you take a single charge Q, so that's an external fixed charge which doesn't move. So this charge Q at point zero, so rho F of R equals Q delta of R. And you ask uh, what is the electrostatic potential phi created by this single charge Q. So if it was just Coulomb, it would be Q over four pi epsilon, four, Q over four pi epsilon R. But here, uh, so we have to solve this equation, which is minus Laplacian plus kappa d square phi equals Q over epsilon delta of R. So this kind of equation uh, is very common and uh, will uh, see it again and again in the, in the field theoretical approach. And the way to do is to, to go to Fourier transform. So if you write phi of r as integral d3k over 2 pi cube e to the i k r phi tilde of k, where phi tilde is the Fourier transform of phi of r, then, of course, when you take the gradient of phi, you bring down i k. So when you take a Laplacian, you bring down i k square. So this equation in Fourier, com and of course, delta of r is the integral d three k over two pi cube of e to the i k r times one. So if you combine these two things, you replace in there, and you see that you get immediately a very simple equation for phi tilde, which is that k square plus kappa d square phi tilde of k equals q over epsilon. Is it clear? No question? Okay. So, phi tilde of k equals q over epsilon, 1 over k square plus kappa square. So I can forget the vector here because it's the... Uh, and therefore, uh, the in, so we just have to stick this back here to calculate the electrostatic potential phi of r because that's what we want. So phi of r is q over epsilon integral d3k over 2 pi cube e to the i k r divided by k square plus kappa d square. So I don't know if you have, has anyone ever seen such a calculation? Is it, uh, yes? So should I do it or? Okay, I'll do it uh, for those. Okay, there are many ways to, to calculate this. So the simplest way I think is by the, just to calculate the integral. Okay, so D3K, if I go to, to spherical coordinates, is K square DK D phi sine theta d theta, right? If I have uh, k1, k2, k3, right? k is a three-dimensional vector, and if this is the vector k, this is the angle phi, and this is the angle theta. Uh, which is uh, minus k square dk d phi d of cosine theta. So if I rewrite phi of r, phi of r is q over epsilon, and phi, so phi is between 0 and 2 pi, and theta is between 0 and pi. And k is 
between 0 and infinity. So the integral is just integral from 0 to infinity dk k square. That's this term. So there is, so here, this integral is e. So I'll write it here. It's e to the i k r cosine theta. Right, I use r as the axis, the z axis. So k r is k r cosine theta divided by k square plus kappa d square. And then I have sum from 0 to 2 pi d phi, sum from 0 to pi uh, with a minus sign, if you want, because of this of d cosine theta. OK, so if I write, so there is no dependence on phi, so there is a factor of 2 pi which comes out from this. And if I write u equals cosine theta, for, so this is 1. For u, for theta equals 0, it's 1. For pi, it's minus 1. So if I invert, I get phi of r. And I forgot the 2 pi cube, which is 8 pi cube. OK? I forgot to write. So I factorize out a factor 2 pi, so it's so I get q over 4 pi square epsilon. So 8 pi cubed times 2 pi. That's the 1 over 4 pi square. The sign changes because I will put here it's integral from 1 to minus 1 when I use this variable. So if I change it, OK, so let me write it. Right? Everybody follows? No question? Okay. So we can do the integral <laughs> over u. And this is, so it's q over 4 pi square epsilon sum from 0 to infinity dk k square. And this in over k square plus kappa d square. And then here, this integral is over i k r e to the i k r minus e to the minus i k r. Right? I just, from here to here, I just did the u integral. Okay, so it is just q over 4 pi square epsilon, 1 over i r, integral from 0 to infinity dk. So k square over k is just k over k square plus kappa d square e to the i k r minus e to the minus i k r. So you see that uh, in order to bring down a k, it's like taking a derivative with respect to r. If I take a derivative with respect to r of this, it brings down i k. And this one brings down also i k. So I can write this as q over 4 pi square epsilon, 1 over i r. And then d, so if I do d by dr, sum from 0 to infinity dk, 1 over k square plus kappa d square times e to the i k r plus e to the minus i k r. So let me, okay, so when I do the d by dr of this, I bring down i k and here minus i k. So it's 
when I do the d by dr of this, it's ik times this, right? So there is a factor i which, which is too much, so I have a factor 1 over i to put here. Is it clear? Sorry, it's a bit technical, but there is no way to, to avoid it. And uh, so it's, if I continue uh, over here, So it simplifies quite a lot because, um, so there is a 1 over i square. So phi of r is minus q over 4 pi square epsilon. Uh, 1 over r, so it's this, d by dr of this integral. Now you see that in this integral, this second term, if I change k into minus k, it will be, I will get something like that, but the integral will be from minus infinity to zero. So it is just integral from minus infinity to plus infinity dk of e to the i k r divided by k square plus kappa d square. Is it uh, clear? Right, I just make a change k into minus k. So then this term, this is invariant. This becomes e to the plus i k r. And the integral, interval of integration is from minus infinity to zero. And so they add like this. Now to calculate this integral, this is given by the residue method. So you all know the residue method. Does anybody not know the complex integrals residue method? Everybody, you don't know? No. Okay. No, I have a question. Um, shouldn't be divided by two? Or yes. nine? No, because you see, when I change k into minus k, so the first one is integrated from zero to infinity, and this one will be integrated from minus infinity to zero. Because the bounds. You no, no, I'm referring to the previous. Uh, here? From, e, from here to, to here? Yes. Why? You, derive, you make the derivative with respect to r. You have two i k. No? Uh, I forgot, uh, by the way, uh, just a second. One. I forgot the d by dr here. Sorry. The, there is a d by d. No, that, no, 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 sorry. No, this, this is correct. So what did I? Because if I make the derivative of the integral in the last line. So here, you make a derivative with respect to r. Down. Down? Yes. So you get yes. ik. Yes. And you get minus ik. So it's exactly. No? Because you divide it by 1, and you multiply it by 1 over i. Yes, because when I because when I bring down d by dr, I bring down i k. So I I want to bring down only k. That's why I divide by i. So when I take a derivative with respect to r, uh, to r, I bring down it's I get this term becomes i k e to the i k r minus i k e to the minus i k r, and I correct the factor of i by one over i. There is no. Question? Okay, so if I look at this integral in the complex plane, in the real and imaginary, so I have two poles. The poles are k equals plus or minus i k d. So one pole is here and one pole is minus i k d. And the integral is over this axis. So then you know the technique is that you should close the contour in the either upper or lower half plane 
so that the exponential factor should go to zero uh, at infinity on the so obviously you need to have a positive imaginary part so if you have a positive imaginary part like this then the contribution in the integral so what you have is that the integral over the, this circuit which I call C dk of e to the i k r divided by k square plus kappa d square is equal when the radius r goes to infinity. So r is this, uh, this radius to the integral from minus r to plus r, which means uh, from minus infinity to plus infinity dk of e to the i k r divided by k square plus kappa d square. OK, and then this is equal to 2, uh, two, two i pi residue of the function at the pole. So here the pole is i kappa d. And the residue of the function at the pole is the value of the function where k is replaced by this, divided by the derivative of the denominator. So the residue is equal to e to the i, i kappa d times r, divided by 2k, or let me write it is e to the i k r, divided by 2k, right? It's the numerator divided by the derivative of the denominator taken at k equals kappa i kappa d. So it is equal to e to the minus k d r divided by 2 i k d. And therefore, and therefore, if I write the result, I have the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity dk e to the i k r divided by k square plus kappa square d equals, so it's 2 i pi times the residue, which is e to the minus kappa d r divided by 2i kappa d. And therefore, phi of r, you take this, you multiply by this. So it's q square. So there is a minus sign coming from the here from the 1 over i square, so it's minus q square over 4 pi square epsilon times 1 over r times 2 i pi, so times pi over kd times d by dr of e to the minus kappa dr. So one of the pi's goes away, you, you take a derivative, the minus sign goes away, you bring down a kd, and you get the final result that phi of r is equal to q over 4 pi epsilon e to the minus kd r over r, where kd is 1 over lambda d is the de Bayhuckel constant. So it's a calculation which may look a bit uh, convoluted, but it's uh, very standard. And uh, once you once you do it once, you you just do it like this. Okay. So, any question about this calculation? So this is really, uh, and I remind you that what we are solving was the equation which may be still there, no, was minus Laplacian 
plus kappa d square phi equals q over epsilon delta of r. So this means that when you have a point charge in a ionic environment, the Coulomb potential created by the point charge Q is no more the Coulomb law, Q over 4 pi epsilon R, but it's a screened Coulomb law, which means it's a Coulomb law with exponential multiplied by an exponential factor, and the scale of the exponential factor is lambda d, which is the, the by length. And uh, this the by length, as I showed you before, it scales like one over the valence of the ions and the square root of the concentration of the ions. You see, uh, by the way, this method tells you that if kappa d is equal to zero, then it's just the Poisson equation for a standard charge, so it's the pure, and you see that if kappa d is zero, you, you get back the standard the Coulomb potential, which is Q over four pi epsilon R. So which means that the solution of the Poisson, of the pure Poisson equation, Laplace and phi equals Q over epsilon delta of R gives you back, right? Of course, there are simpler ways to, to find the Coulomb law, but for the by uh, I don't know exactly. So in, in uh, by the way, this equation in uh, particle physics also, it's called the Yukawa potential this kind of potential, and uh, it's the kind of, uh, of uh, interaction potential that you have between the particles when the exchange particle is massive, has a mass. So in, you see the electrostatic interaction between two particles come from the exchange of photons, which have zero mass, and these terms in field theory has the role of a mass, so the equation which defines the interaction is something like this, but if the particle that you exchange has a mass, then it has this form. So for instance, in nuclear physics, the interaction, I mean, in the old days, people were thinking that the interaction between uh, protons, neutron, etc., was uh, mediated by mesons, pions, and, uh, and the pion is a, particle with a mass, that's why the strong interaction has a short range. So it's the same here. The, here the reason is the screening. The particle is surrounded by a shell of positive and negative ions, which <coughs> it's like uh, Faraday screening or whatever, and so the, the exchange, the interaction is exponentially decaying. Any question? Uh, what else did I want to say? So, to conclude, so I will uh, now, um, yes, so Poisson-Boltzmann, so this is a first step approximation to Poisson-Boltzmann. The Debye-Huckel equation can be solved, it's a linear equation, so you can solve it much easier in a much easier way than, uh, than the Poisson-Boltzmann, and it is a good starting point for solving numerically Poisson-Boltzmann equation. So the Poisson-Boltzmann, I will uh, show you how one can calculate the free energy, what is the free energy of the Poisson-Boltzmann um, theory. So uh, before that, I want to emphasize a little bit some of the defects of the Poisson-Boltzmann theory, what is wrong in the Poisson-Boltzmann theory. Uh, so, a few things which are, so it's Poisson-Boltzmann is good in many cases, it's a good approximation in biological, so in physiological conditions. So physiological conditions is essentially for NaCl with concentration C of the order of 0.1 molar. 
And then it gives, uh, if you look at profile of, of these kind of ions uh, near charged surfaces or near DNA or things like that, it's okay. Now, when what is missing or bad? So it's not good if you have multivalent ion. Yes? Sorry? If physiological Okay, and uh, the last thing which is missing is that it's a mean field approximation. So no fluctuations and no correlation effects. And so it's missing uh, in case of strong, strongly charged surfaces or things like that it's it's missing quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of uh, phenomena okay so this any question about all these so now the question is how do you calculate the free energy of the of the poisson boltzmann or of uh, in in the poisson boltzmann approximation So the free energy, of course, we know it's U minus Ts. So we need uh, two ingredients. Yes? Sorry? I'm, I'm sorry. Like this part? Yes. Uh, good. Well, I'm not missing bad. Let's say bad or missing effects. These are the few things which are not taken into account in the Poisson Boltzmann approximation, in this midfield approximation. So, this approximation is not good, we will see, when you have multivalent ions, because when you have multivalent ions, usually you are not in a. Okay, Poisson Boltzmann is good for weak fields, weak potentials, weak, weak everything. 
but when you have multivalent ions, usually it's not weak because things depend on the valence to some, usually to power two or three. So it goes very fast with the valence. And so for, my, for instance, magnesium ions are very important in biology because they regulate a lot of things. You cannot use Poisson-Boltzmann equation to describe uh, the behavior or the profiles of magnesium ions. Second thing is steric effect, so there is no, at short distance, nothing prevents the ions to come as close as they together, even to collapse on each other. Third thing is about water structure. You treat the background as a uniform medium with, uh, with constant dielectric constant, with a uniform dielectric constant. But you see, for instance, if you put Water is dipoles, right? Dipoles like this, floating around. So if you put an ion which is charged, a big ion, or even not a big, but a, with a big charge, if you put an ion in water, it will be hydrated, which means that locally the dipoles will orient, and you will have some structure of the water, which will affect the dielectric constant of the water locally, and this is, of course, not at all taken into account in Poisson-Boltzmann equation because you treat it as a uniform medium. And finally, uh, okay, there are many, maybe other things which are not, this is the ones I was thinking about. Uh, mean field, so there are no fluctuations. That's the, all the standard uh, problems of mean field, no correlation effect, no fluctuations. Um, each particle sees the mean field created by all the others, and uh, as a result, there is no correlation effect. When you calculate uh, simply the correlation functions, they are trivial. Yes? So this solution is for like uh, three Yes, uh, the, for uh, just a single charge in infinite space, in infinite uh, a free charge in infinite ionic uh, medium characterized by kappa d. So I remind you that kappa d is given uh, in terms of the ion concentrations of the various types. I can give you the formula. Kappa d square, which is lambda d to the minus two, is sum over all species of 4 pi Lb Ck Zk square, where Zk is the valence of the ions. So, so for, for some problem we have to solve this linear equation for that particular boundary condition. Exactly. Yes. So if you have, a, for instance, I don't know, if you have a charged wall uh, or, so this was in free space, but if you have a, something like this, let's say you have a charge here and you impose phi zero on the surface, then you have to solve with this boundary condition. Here the boundary condition, the implicit boundary condition, it's implicit because when you take the Fourier transform, implicitly you assume that the function goes to zero at infinity, right? Otherwise you cannot make a, a Fourier transform. So the fact that you solve it by Fourier transform implicitly implies that the boundary condition is that phi goes to zero at, at infinity. So you can have any boundary conditions, but then uh, you can solve it. If it's trivial geometry, you can solve it analytically. Otherwise, you solve it numerically. But there are, since it's a linear equation, a linear partial differential equation, there are many, <coughs> many, many simple ways to, to solve it numerically. Yes? Yes, so, I mean, nothing prevents you to use it, but the question is whether it's good approximation or not good approximation. So what I'm saying is that it's not a good approximation when the valence is not one, essentially. But, but assume that it's not valence, right? Sorry? No, I didn't, no it's a, I, I didn't assume anything about uh, anything. It's just an approximation that I present here. 
next uh, week when we will do the field theory, it will be more clear when the approximation is good or not good. There, is, there will be a parameter uh, which is an expansion parameter and will show that the zeroth order of this approximation is the Poisson-Boltzmann and then we can see the corrections and things like that. But this requires to dig more into the, the system. Okay, no more question. Okay. Okay, so um, we saw last time that the internal energy U is essentially given by epsilon over 2. So it's in. So it's epsilon over 2 integral d3r of gradient phi square. That's the internal energy. Now, what is the entropy? So the entropy, it's the, I will use the, the standard phenomenological form for the entropy. And, uh, okay, so you will tell me if you, Okay, I, I will write it first and then we will, uh, I will discuss it. So for the entropy, it's the entropy of mixing of a gas of particles, so it's minus Kb integral D3R sum over K, let's say, of Ck of R log So does this ring a bell to some of you? Who has ever seen such an expression for the entropy? <coughs> nobody? Okay, so I guess if nobody has ever seen it, I will try to derive it for you. So the entropy, uh, in fact, when in this kind of uh, problems, I will do, so everything I do is, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of hand-waving arguments because the, I didn't justify the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. I just told you, you do this, you do that. And the justification for all this we'll see next week. But, so if I write the partition function for the system, so there is one factor which I, I forgot a few times, which is one over factorial n which is the one over factorial n, which comes from the fact that all the ions of each species are the same. So in fact, it's a product over k. Over all species of ion, there is a factor one over factorial n to the, over the k. And then, so I will do it only for one species now. And then you have a product of all the drs and e to the minus the U electrostatic, the electrostatic energy, interaction energy of the particle. And these are product over all charges present in the system, and this is the electrostatic interaction energy of the system. So this, so let me assume that there is only one kind of charge in the, to simplify, and then we just have to, it's additive, so we we'll just add. So Z is essentially I will write something like 1 over factorial n. <coughs> then e to the minus u, it's essentially the e to the minus uh, beta u, sorry. Beta epsilon over 2 integral gradient phi square. And this is essentially, this factor is v to the n. So, now you have this, uh, so this is the internal energy and this is what is going to play the role of the entropy. So the entropy in this kind of system is E to the minus two or E to the minus log factorial N divided by V to the N minus beta epsilon over two integral gradient phi 
square. Now, if I look at this term, of course, you know um, the Stirling formula. So the Stirling formula is an approximation for factorial n, which is valid for large n. So in the thermodynamic limit, you have factorial n equivalent for large n to n over e to the power n. And then there is a correcting factor, which is square root of 2 pi n, but uh, I don't care about that one. But this is the interesting factor. N over e to the factorial n. So the term which corresponds to the entropy is e to the minus log, and it's n over e v to the power n, which can be written as e to the minus n log n over v uh, minus n, n over v minus plus n. Okay? So, so this is essentially this formula is essentially this one. So let me show you why. Because this term is just, if I consider that there is a certain concentration C of R of ions such that the integral D3R of C of R is N, then you see that I can rewrite this expression as e to the minus integral d3r, yes, c of r log c of r minus c of r. So it starts looking a little bit like this. And now, what you want to do, so you know that when you calculate entropies, you need always a reference state with respect to which you calculate your entropy. So if I decide that the reference state is the state that, so my entropy then is something like S equals minus KB integral D3R C of R log C of R minus C of R. Now, if I want that my entropy is equal to zero if C of R is uniform equal to C zero, then you just have to subtract, and then you write that S equals minus KB integral D3R C of R log C of R divided by C zero minus C of R plus C zero. When I do that, so what I have done, I have divided by log C zero, which is a constant, but remember that the integral of C of R is a constant, so this is, this division by C zero is irrelevant, and the addition of C zero is also irrelevant because, so all these, so this is the expression of the entropy that, so this is a very common entropy so this entropy is zero in the reference state, the reference state being the uniform state C of R equals C zero. And this is the excess entropy, which can be positive or negative, when the concentration is modified with respect to the uniform concentration. Yes? Here, so it's from here, right? Yeah. So you, you imagine the same thing locally. Yeah. That's all. It's, I mean, it's, uh, in fact, so you can justify a little bit better by putting things on a lattice and doing the, things like that. But it's essentially, it's very phenomenological. 
and you will see a better derivation uh, next week. It's just uh, you start from here and you assume that the density or the concentrations are not global, but they vary locally, slowly compared to whatever the usual uh, the usual song, and so you replace this n over v, this c by c of r, and etc. Okay. No, see, you know it. First of all, this one is an excess. So actually, this is very similar to S, you know, the one of the standard form of the entropy is S equals minus sum if you have of PI log PI, right? You know this, this formula. So, No, but pi is smaller than one. So if pi is smaller than one, then this kind of entropy is positive. Here it's the entropy with respect to a given state, the state of uniform C0. So the- This is the state of maximum entropy? No. State of maximum entropy, no. When you have a, a system which has a energy and entropy, you don't maximize the entropy. You minimize the free energy because you have balance between uh, internal energy and entropy. Maximizing the entropy is for isolated system without... Uh... So, any questions? So, as a result... Yes? So, I mean, this is uh, for one macro state. CR is a macro state of the system and we have the entropy. But, yes, uh, it's a macro state. Uh, yes, with local. Uh, yes, with local concentrations. Uh, yeah, I mean, non-uniform. Yes. But uh, it's hard to see. I mean, for me, at least of now, the connection of C of R and the potential. I mean, it should have somehow be related. So okay. So this will come now. This is related by the Poisson equation. So let me write. So let me write the free energy. So the free energy F is epsilon over 2 integral D3R gradient phi to the square minus TS, so plus KBT. So uh, let's assume that there are several species in the system, so it's sum over K integral D3R of CK of R log CK of R by CK zero minus CK of R plus CK zero. Okay? That's the expression for the free energy, taking into account electrostatic energy and entropy of the fluid. And then, of course, there is the relation between the two, which is given by the Poisson equation which relates, which is minus epsilon Laplacian phi equals sum over k of qk ck of r. That's Coulomb equation, uh, Poisson equation, right? But minus epsilon Laplacian phi equals concentrate or density of ions. So this this is the relation between the two. In fact, from this, uh, from this, you can you can derive the Poisson-Boltzmann equation by looking by minimizing what is the so precisely it's uh, by minimizing the free energy with respect to the CK of R. So by what is the concentration, the ion concentration which minimizes F. So if you write delta F by delta CK of R equals zero, you get back the Boltzmann equation, Boltzmann weights. Okay, so I will do this because uh, we will use, so this is a way to, to do functional derivatives. I don't know if you have... Uh, seen already functional derivatives in your life? 
who has seen, who has not seen functional derivative. Okay, okay, so I will. Okay. Yes? Sorry? What is the definition of entropy in biological systems? Well, it depends. It's, uh, the entropy is defined as the. First of all, entropy is defined only for uh, equilibrium system. You don't. You, it's. I mean, there are definitions out of equilibrium, but uh, typically entropy can be defined only when you have a system at equilibrium then you can define a macro state and the macro state is a kind of superposition or a sampling of a certain number of micro states and the entropy is that just the log of the number of micro states which participate in the macro state right in biology if you're i mean i'm doing biology at equilibrium <laughs> so um, of course uh, you can define entropy if the system is slowly varying or whatever and, but uh, but in biology, it's uh, it's a different it's a different question. I mean, if you take into account the fact that it's time dependent, that uh, the system is evolving, that it's alive, etc., everything has to all the framework has to be has to be changed. Why I'm talking about biology here? I'm looking. What happens, for instance, if you have a membrane, if you have ions near the membrane, what, how the ions will be close to the membranes, how can they go through, or things like that. So it's, it's really not related. I mean, the fact that it's a biological, it's just a biological object. It's, it's not, a, I'm not considering living objects. Exactly, yes. It's just the, the fact that the ions are moving around. If you are colder, if the system is colder, the ions will move less, and if it's and things like that. I mean, it's, it's just the standard entropy uh, that, you, uh, that you can imagine. I, I thought your question was about uh, life, <laughs> open system, so it's completely different. Yes? Sorry? Z equals? E to the power S by K. Yes, yes, exactly. How did you do that? Yeah, well, you have Z equals E to the minus beta F. So it's E to the minus 1 over KT U minus TS. So it's E to the minus beta U, which is the beta epsilon over 2 integral phi, gradient phi square. And then e to the one over e to the s over k. Sorry. Yes. The e to the minus beta u was the term e to the minus beta over two integral uh, epsilon gradient phi square, which I. No? No, you didn't? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now I go. Functional derivatives. Okay. So you see, um, very often we will see that, and that's the general principle, that's the same kind of thing that you do when you derive a Legendre, Lagrange equation in, uh, in mechanics, when you go when you want to derive from the Lagrangian, the, the Euler-Lagrange equation, which gives you the Newton equation. 
you have to, so you write a certain function of a given trajectory with fixed ends, and then you look what is the trajectory which minimizes this quantity. So here, for instance, what we want to do is to find what is the ion concentration which will minimize this function f. So if you have a function of, of one variable, f of x, you know that to look for the, to minimize this function f of x, you will write df or df dx equals zero. Now, if you have many variables, x1, xn, you will have to write, for any i, you have to write partial f by partial xi equals zero. Now the question is what happens if you have f of a certain function, let's say c of r, where c of r is defined everywhere in space, and you want to, you want to, so you can imagine that you discretize this variable c of, so you discretize your space, and then the variable, this is a function f of c of r1, c of r2, etc., c of r m. So you have discretized your space. These are the variables, and you want to write that the gradient of f with respect to each of these variables is equal to zero. So what you write, what you write is what's called a functional derivative. You write the delta f by delta c of r equals zero. Okay, so how does it work? So usually the, usually the, we have a function, let's say, uh, I will call it, um, how can I call it? We call it W or F, actually F. F will be, so let me, yes, F will be, usually takes the form of an integral over F of R of a certain function, let's say uh, F of C of R. Right, so this is really exactly the kind of thing that we have. So in order to see, so F is a function of C of R at each point in space. So I will use this notation. So what you want to do is you replace C of R by C of R plus delta C of R. You expand to first order, so this, you exp expand F of C of R plus delta C of R to first order in delta C of R. So what you get usually is that f of c of r plus delta c of r. How can is equal to f of c of r plus integral d three r of delta f by delta c of r delta c of r plus order delta c squared. Okay, so it's just a, a formal uh, expansion like this. And uh, therefore, uh, if you want to write that the variation is zero, so this, this quantity here, the coefficient of delta c of r is called the functional derivative of f with respect to c of r. So it's really, you obtain it by just doing a, a simple, uh, 
simple Taylor expansion. And writing that the function is minimal is just writing that delta F by delta C of R for any R is equal to zero. Okay, so if I now so this is uh, something we will use very much uh, that's used uh, constantly in field theory and uh, in variational principles in you know, all kind of uh, cases. So, for instance, if I take the entropy and if I look, so the entropy, as we saw, is minus Kb integral d3r of Ck of r log Ck of r over Ck0 minus Ck of r plus Ck0. So the, now I will give you a rule because you, you can do the expansion. So what I suggest is you, do the exp, you just do this, right? You replace CK of R by CK of R plus delta CK. You subtract, etc. You expand to first order. So I will give you a rule to do it very fast without uh, any difficulty. So of, first of all, when you're like this, you write it D. C prime, because it's a integration variable, so let's call it. And in order to calculate delta S by delta CK of R, what you do is first you take a derivat der derivative of the integrand with respect to CK of R prime, and then you use the rule that delta CK of R prime by delta CK of R equals delta of R minus R prime. Okay, so the, the reason being, of course, that you can write that CK of R is the integral dr prime delta of r minus r prime ck of r prime. So the, deri the functional derivative of ck of r with respect to ck of r prime is just the delta function here. So if you use these rules here, you get that delta s by delta ck of r is equal to minus KB times. So essentially, what you have is you take a derivative of this. This will give you log CK of R by CK zero. And then plus one, minus one. So that's it. Okay, so I suggest uh, if you have uh, if you have uh, afternoon sessions or whatever uh, that you practice a little bit this functional integral, this functional uh, derivation, because we will use it uh, extensively next week. So, yes. And no, because you don't. In your, yes, there is a sum over k here. But of course, you take, a, it's only the ck, the specific ck that you're looking. So let me write it as sum over l here. Now, if I take a derivative with respect to ck, I will select only l equals k in this sum. Right, because I, it's like uh, if you have a vari variable x1 to xn, 
if you take a derivative with respect to xi, you pick up only the xi term. And so uh, this is the result of this uh, functional derivative. Is it, uh, so it's maybe a bit fast, but um, so th can you do that uh, in uh, the tutoring? Where are the tutors? Are you familiar with this? Yes? So you can do it, you can uh, add some exercises. And uh, uh, for instance, for this, and uh, for instance, uh, the, the standard exercise is to derive the Newton equation from, uh, from the Lagrangian, which is sum from 0 to t, I don't know, um, uh, d tau of uh, m, x, right? Writing, that's the Lagrangian, and the exercise is, you write delta L by delta x of t equals zero, and you should get Newton equation. That's an example of a functional derivative that, uh, that you learn. Uh, so these are the so-called Euler-Lagrange equation. Okay, so if I look at here, so there are two terms to take a derivative. So if I want to see what is the best CK, how the the concentration of ions will adjust in order to minimize the free energy. So I have two terms to two terms to to consider. One is the this one, and the other one is this one. So the other one, and of course, so if I look at delta by delta CK of R integral d3r gradient phi square. Okay, so we saw that you can integrate this by part if you assume that there is no boundary term. So this is the same as integral delta by delta ck of r integral d3r of phi of r Laplacian phi of R. You remember, we saw that uh, yesterday, that uh, up to boundary terms, which we don't care. And uh, where can I write this? I will come back here. Okay. So, and then all the rules of uh, derivatives apply. So, then you have delta by delta CK of R of the integral, let me call it uh, D3 R prime, gradient phi of R prime square. So the first, so then I will apply it to here plus applying to there. So it's in minus integral D3 R delta phi of R prime by delta CK of R, Laplacian phi of R prime. So, and the second term is minus integral D3 R phi of R prime gradient square delta phi by of R prime by delta CK of R, right? It's just, and the, since it's not, R prime is a variable of integration, so it commutes with the delta by delta CK because it's, it's not acting on the same point. And therefore, if you integrate this by part, it acts here, so it doubles this term. So this is just minus two times integral D3 uh, D3 R prime, phi of R prime, 
and I write it as delta by delta ck of r prime Laplacian phi of r prime. Right, I can commute whatever, you, you can do whatever you want with these, uh, they commute and, and, they, and you just apply the standard rules of derivatives because it's a derivative. Now, because of the Poisson <coughs> equation, you see that so because of Poisson equation, Laplacian phi of R prime equals with a minus epsilon equals sum over k qk ck of r and therefore delta by delta phi by delta ck of r of Laplacian phi of r prime is equal to minus qk over epsilon delta of r minus r prime. Yes? Sorry? Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay, next. I will. Okay, sorry. I'm going a bit fast, but I think this is a kind of thing you have to do in, uh, in tutoring, and uh, it's, it's really. Uh, it's, it's not difficult, it's, it's just an extension of the standard rules of uh, taking derivatives. But uh, when you do field theory and these kind of things, you cannot avoid uh, going through these, uh, so these functional derivatives and then uh, we will see uh, functional integration also, which is, uh, okay. So, but anyway, that was a very good question. <laughs> um, Okay, so is it clear that when you have this, it implies this? Well, I just used the rule that I said that you take a derivative of standard derivative and the delta of CK by CK, uh, sorry, this was R prime, delta of CK of R prime by delta CK of R gives a delta function. And therefore, you have the property that delta by delta CK of R of the integral d3 r prime gradient phi of r prime square equals minus two times, so it's plus two qk over epsilon integral d3 r prime phi of r prime delta of r minus r prime, which is two qk over epsilon phi of r. And therefore, we can write that delta f by delta ck of r equals, so the first term will be epsilon over two. So the first term is the derivative of epsilon over two times this. So it's qk phi of r and the derivative of the of this term is plus kbt we saw before it was log of ck of r by ck0 so this is the functional derivative of f with respect to ck of r and this is equal to 0 the CK, which minimize the free energy, satisfy this equation. And the solution of this equation is, of course, the Boltzmann distribution that CK of R equals CK of zero e to the minus beta QK phi of R. Right, by just... Uh, writing this equal to zero. And therefore, you see that at equilibrium, 
the concentration is given as a Boltzmann distribution as a function of phi of r, and phi satisfies the Poisson equation, so this is just the standard Poisson-Boltzmann equation, which you obtain, which shows that the Poisson-Boltzmann equation minimizes the free energy as written like this. Any question? So apart from this technical point of functional derivatives, it's, uh, it's very simple. So what I'm saying is that delta F by delta CK of R for this free energy equals zero is equivalent to Poisson-Boltzmann equation. Sorry. Yes? Yes? Okay. Yeah. So I say that this is my free energy with the Poisson equation. Now, if I minimize this free energy with respect to the ionic concentration, so I look what is the concentration of ions which makes this free energy minimum, you find that the concentration is given by a Boltzmann weight, Boltzmann factor, in this potential phi of R but phi was related to CK by this, so you need to solve these two equations simultaneously, and solving these two equations simultaneously is just the Poisson-Boltzmann. Okay. Right? I mean, you just replace CK here by, by this expression, and you get back the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. Yes? Yes, yes. And the minimization of free energy is also exact under the assumption that you are working at the thermodynamic limit? Yes. Uh, so, no, it's in the assumption that uh, it's an assumption that the free energy is uh, minimized, that at equilibrium the free energy is... Yes. Yes. Actually, we, you, we will justify it next week again by the saddle point method uh, in field theory, yes. Exactly what? It seems to be exact result. So where is the that mean field approximation? Oh, this this free energy is an approximation. It's not an exact free energy. It's a phenomenological kind of free energy which I derived by a lot of hand waving arguments. But this is not the exact uh, free energy of the system. So the entropy was the part was exact. It's just the uh, internal energy was there was an approximation. Everything is approximate. The internal energy is not, ex it's the internal energy of the, yes, the entropy, of course, it's a, the entropy of, uh, of a gas of free particle, that this is a, really a gas of free particle, and the, the free energy, it's the free energy of a system of charges when, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's very approximate. The, the kind of that it's mean field is that you have independent particles, a free gas of particles moving in the same external potential phi. So they all live in an external potential phi of R in space. And this potential, uh, this external potential phi is self-consistently created by the particles themselves. But there is no direct interactions or correlation between the particles directly from one to another. Whereas in the real theory, as I showed you, if you write it in terms of the individual particle, there you have correlations of all order. Okay. Um, last thing is the... And okay, so I give you as an exercise the, uh, so this is the Poisson-Boltzmann free energy. And if you go to the debye huckel approximation, and this is an exercise. So 
so you will not be surprised that the Dubai Huckel free energy is just epsilon, epsilon over 2 integral d3r gradient phi of r square plus kappa d. Okay, so this is in the Dubai Huckel approximation, this is what you get. And I let you do it yourself. Okay. It's an exercise. It's uh, quite trivial. So the free energy is quadratic in the phi's, and you can calculate everything. Uh, okay. Okay, so now I come to specific examples of solutions of the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. And the first case, so the first case of study is planar case. The planar case is one surface. plus counter ions. So what are counter ions? So counter ions are, so one, I assume that there is one surface, which is a hard surface that can, through which ions cannot go through. It has a charge, I will assume a negative charges here, with a charge density sigma, which is therefore negative. And here, I will assume counter ions. Counter ions are just ions which have the opposite sign of these. So it's not salt, it's counter ions. So it's plus ions which are floating around. So it's the simplest uh, geometry that you can imagine. And we will see uh, how you can, um, okay. Uh, so let me call the axis Z. And I will assume that, uh, that uh, it's monovalent ions. So, okay. So the Poisson, and it, this problem is called the electric double layer. Double layer. The reason is, as we will see, that there is a layer of counter ions which are covering the wall with a certain profile which decays slowly to infinity. Okay, so the Poisson-Boltzmann equation is Laplace and phi equals, so Laplace and phi equals rho f over epsilon, so rho f is precisely its sigma, I, I will come back, so but then plus C0e over epsilon e to the minus beta e phi. And rho f is the density, the fixed charges is just the wall, so rho f is sigma delta of z. Yes? The sign should be minus uh, Yes, absolutely, it should be minus here. Thank you. Either on one side or the other. Okay, so when you have an equation like this with this kind of symmetry, of course, phi will depend only on z. Phi of x, y, z is a function of z only because uh, there is translation. I mean, I assume that the wall is infinite, so there is translation invariance along the x, y axis. So the electrostatic potential depends only on the distance. And because of this, so the equation is minus phi second of z equals sigma
So you see that if I integrate this equation on a small between here and here, inside phi is equal to zero. So if you integrate from, uh, let's say, minus a certain distance d, which is very small, to plus d, which is very small, so d being minus d plus d, you get, so I integrate dz, this equation, and you get that minus, so the integral of phi second is phi prime, so you get the boundary condition, which is the standard boundary condition, that phi prime of zero plus, so phi prime at zero, and I assume that phi, on the other side of the wall, phi prime, the electric field is zero, because phi prime is related to the electric field, so phi prime of zero is sigma over epsilon. So this is the boundary condition here. Okay, so I have to solve this so. So I have to solve the equation phi second equals minus C zero E over epsilon E to the minus beta E phi with the boundary condition that phi prime of zero equals minus sigma over epsilon. Okay? So there are many ways to, so I can give you the solution and we can check that it works, or you can try to derive it uh, by first integrals. So deriving it by first integrals is, you know, when you have an equation like this, you multiply both sides by phi prime. So you have phi prime, phi second equals minus C zero E over epsilon phi prime E to the minus beta E phi. So phi prime, phi second is just the derivative of one half phi prime square prime. And this is just C zero over beta epsilon e to the minus beta e phi prime. Yes. Which means that so if both derivatives are equal, then you can integrate, which means that this is equal to this plus a constant, etc. Okay, so I will leave you to do that as an exercise, continue all the way through, and you will get the equation, the solution, which is of the form, you will see that phi is of the form A log Z plus B plus some phi zero. So let's check that this is a, indeed a solution of the equation. So phi prime is A over Z plus B. Phi second is minus A over Z plus B square. And if I want to check if it matches, so I have E to the minus beta E phi beta E phi is E to the minus beta E phi zero with this times E to the minus beta E A log Z plus B equals one over Z plus B to the square, uh, to the beta E A, sorry. And here is e to the minus right I'm just replacing this expression in e to the minus beta e phi so it's e to the minus beta e phi zero times e to the minus beta e a log z plus b and so this comes down as z plus b to the beta e a And this is e to the minus. So if you want to identify phi second with this uh, equation, 
then uh, you must have, and I will stop after that, So we have beta EA equals 2, which means that, so uh, I try this. So I have to determine three parameters, A, B, and phi 0. And I have to adjust them in such a way that with the parameters, with the correct parameters A, B, phi 0, they will satisfy the correct uh, Poisson-Boltzmann uh, Poisson -Boltzmann equation. So beta EA equals 2, which means A equals 2 over beta e. And uh, what else? Then I will write, so let me write this equation. So phi second is minus, so I would have minus a over z plus b square equals minus c0 e over epsilon, e to the minus beta e phi, so it's e to the minus beta e phi zero divided by z plus b, and then since I have used this to the square. So I have this additional uh, condition that a should be equal to c zero e over epsilon e to the minus beta e phi zero. But A is 2 over beta E. So this gives me E to the minus beta E phi zero equals 2 epsilon over C zero beta E square. Okay. And then we have still one parameter to match, which is B. And this comes from the boundary condition. So we saw that the boundary condition was phi prime of zero equals uh, phi prime zero, sorry? Ah, sigma over, minus sigma over S, uh, over epsilon. And phi prime zero is A over B at Z equals zero. So we'll have the equation A over B equals minus sigma over epsilon, which gives you B. So we have all the parameters defined like this. And uh, so we will continue tomorrow and uh, we will see what, what are the exact expression and the properties of the layers of ions, etc. Any questions? No question. So try to do the exercises, uh, particularly on functional derivatives and things like that. I want to sign my attendance. Sorry? I want to sign my attendance. Oh, uh, it's circulating around, I think, probably, no? Uh, or it should have come here.